Well, let me invite your attention to Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6. You know from the weeks that we've already spent in Nehemiah that he was given a commission and a vision from the Lord. Early on, he saw God's favor when he went before uh, the king and got both permission and provision. Um, the, the same king who had stopped previous attempts to rebuild the city now is giving that uh, to ne- Nehemiah. Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem. The Judeans have been inspired to join him. They have worked side by side, rebuilding the wall, restoring dignity and security to the city of Jerusalem. Now, it hasn't been easy. There has been opposition Uh, There has been ridicule, even threats from the enemies of God's people, but we've seen throughout the book of Nehemiah that continually Nehemiah returned to prayer when those opposition and, and, and threats and ridicule came up, and he continually reminded the people to remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And we saw last week the problems didn't just arise from those outside the camp, there were some within the camp. Uh, taking advantage of others and and profiting from the situation. But when they were confronted, to their credit, uh, there was repentance. They set their own interests aside and began to look out for the needs of the greater community and the work of the Lord. Now, in Nehemiah 6, uh, they can see the goal line. The work on the wall is nearly complete, but we're going to see that spiritually there is never a time to coast or to let down or to relax. Listen, if you're walking with the Lord and if you're serving the Lord, the enemy never lets up. He will continually oppose you. Nehemiah chapter 6, let's read verses 1 through 14 together. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together at Kerim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, that is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king, and he's referring to Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, who currently ruled, the king will hear of these reports, so now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you inventing them out of your own mind. For all they wanted was to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Now, when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by might. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sabalat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sinbalat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noah, Noidea and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So Sanballat and company had failed in their previous attempts. You remember their previous attempts were against uh, all of the people trying to stop the work. They tried to ridicule and, and threaten them and get them to, uh, to revolt against Nehemiah's leadership and stop the work. Well, now they're going to take a different approach. Their approach now is to directly attack Nehemiah and to take him out. They're either going to remove him somehow so there's a void of leadership or they're going to attempt to discredit him so the people won't trust him and so they'll lose heart to follow him and they'll give up the work. Now, these three tactics we're going to see in chapter 6, the enemy still uses today, especially when he attempts to discredit leaders. You know, so many leaders have have fallen in our day, it's it's difficult not to be suspect of, of all leaders. Think about it. Leaders are blamed for what they don't do. 
They're, they're criticized for what they do. They're misunderstood. They're misquoted, often without opportunity to, to speak to the truth and set the record straight. And so I thought about this in the case of Nehemiah. I thought, you know, maybe we need to be more careful not to rush to judgment, but wait until the dust settles and, and truth becomes more evident. Or, or more importantly, maybe we need to be more careful to keep our focus on the Lord and not on leaders. Uh, many ministries have been devastated because the focus was on the leader, and when the leader fell, that, that group or organization was destroyed. Now, I'll say this morning, this is not just about leaders within spiritual organizations. If you're a leader in your company or your organization, you know the tremendous pressures that come daily, the things that you face every day. Well, God's leaders like Nehemiah are not exempt, but I would say this morning, for every leader who faithfully serves Uh, In any organization where God has placed them, there's great reward. You are called as a leader to use your influence and to use your position for the Lord. Don't don't give up. Don't, Don't decide it doesn't matter. Don't decide it just isn't worth it. Listen, Satan is going to attack any leader in a place of authority who can use his position to honor the Lord. We we shouldn't be surprised, nor should we be unprepared when those attacks come. I was thinking this week about uh, the attacks that, that came on Nehemiah and the, the attacks that came on leaders, and I got an interesting quip uh, forwarded to me from Jim Hughes that said this, if Adam and Eve had been Cajuns, they would have eaten the snake rather than the apple and saved us a lot of trouble. <laughs> they didn't eat the snake, they weren't Cajuns, so we're still going to have trouble. Well, let's look at the three attacks. Number one... Uh, they simply sent the message in verse 2. I, I would summarize the message as this. Why can't we be friends? Now, some of you, this is, this is going to date me, some of you, if, if you could imagine with me, it's like they sent him one of those musical cards, and when he opened the card, it was Smash Mouth singing, Why Can't We Be Friends? That was their message to Nehemiah. What, what are they saying here? They said, look, let's meet together. The, the idea together makes it sound like a, a, a comfortable visit. Now think about the fact they had opposed everything the Jews had done up to this point, and now they're, it appears they're trying to play nice. Nehemiah, come on, let's, let's talk about it. Let's be reasonable. Maybe, maybe we can make a truce. Maybe, maybe we can have peace. You notice it says they asked him to meet on the plains of Ono. That was 25 miles from Jerusalem. It's a hard day's journey, and it would put Nehemiah close to Sanballat's home province, Samaria. Why are they asking Nehemiah to come to them? Because they're trying to distract him. They're trying to disrupt the work. If they pull Nehemiah away from the work in Jerusalem, the work is not going to be completed. Now, I don't want to try to speak for other leaders, but I will tell you, distraction is a very regular tactic. In fact, for me, it's probably one of the biggest tactics Satan uses against me, just to get me distracted. There are a lot of things to do. There There are good things to do, but they may not be the things that God told me to do. I'm going to tell you when my greatest points of distractions are so that you can, you can, those of you that pray for me can add this to your list. My greatest points of distraction come during study time and prayer time. Doesn't that make sense that Satan would do that? To distract, to keep me from the word and to keep me from prayer. Well, they want to meet with Nehemiah. Maybe they're going to offer a compromise. Look, Nehemiah, if you'll stop building the wall, we're going to help you. You, you got people who, who need food. You have people who need to be settled in houses. You, you need protection. If you'll come meet with us, then maybe we can work something out. Listen, when you compromise with, with the devil, when you compromise with Satan, that always leads to defeat. To compromise, you, you have to give something up, and you're, you're giving him ground. Once, once we have a, a direction from God, we have to carry the task to completion. And if we do that, and if we focus on that, God's going to take care of those other needs. Did the people need homes? Absolutely. They had not opportunity to build homes yet. Did they need food? Yes. We saw last week there was a famine. Did they need protection? Yes. The gates and doors were not hung yet. They needed all those things, but Nehemiah was trying to keep them focused on the main purpose that God had called them to. We love to quote Matthew six thirty three: Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But do we believe it? If Nehemiah and the people would stay focused on God's things, God was going to take care of all the other needs that they have. Nehemiah knew that these men were trying to be helpful. He had no need to meet with them. The Jews had nothing in common with with these men. And there was no basis for cooperation. 
Why would they even consider meeting and, and compromising, cooperating? Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 gives us this admonition, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What can fellowship, what light can fellowship have with darkness? You know, we use that verse to talk about marriage or business alliances, and it's a good truth to consider. But the bottom line here is Paul is saying any close affiliation with unbelievers can lead a believer astray from pure devotion to Christ. And we need to be very cautious about that. Nehemiah suspected they were up to, uh, to no good, foul play. Getting him away would stop the work. It would also give them opportunity to ambush him. But look at his response. He doesn't openly attack them or question their motives. He simply says, I, I can't leave. I can't leave. Four times he says that. Now, these guys were sincere about wanting to meet with Nehemiah. And they were sincere about being helpful. Why didn't they come to Jerusalem? Four times they ask him to meet, and four times he responds the same way. See, Nehemiah is, is discerning. He realizes what's up, but he's also determined. If it was wrong for him to leave the work the first time, then it was wrong for him to leave the work the fourth time. It was Nehemiah's conviction that God called him to this work. It was conviction that he was to stay on course and let nothing distract him until he completed the task. Listen, if we're going to avoid compromise, we're going to avoid being taken out by the evil one, we've got to have convictions. Satan's not going to give up and and go away the first time that we we rebuff him. He's going to attempt to wear us down. He doesn't leave you alone the first time that you stand against him. He's going to get you to question your decision. He's going to get you to rethink your stance. He's going to keep pecking away and pecking away and pecking away. Well, as we see here in chapter 6, when enough time is given, true motives are revealed. Since they couldn't get Nehemiah to come to a friendly meeting, they moved on to strategy number 2 down in verses 5 through 7 that we read a few moments ago. They said, hey, Nehemiah, um, we're here to help you, brother. Listen, man, we're, we're trying to keep you out of trouble with the king. You know, listen to this, you know people are saying you're plotting to revolt that you're building the wall around the city so you can lead a revolt and and you can be king. Now, Nehemiah, you don't want this report of what people are saying to get back to the king. So let's get together and and let's figure out how to deal with this. Can I tell you, any leader, not just church leaders, any leader loves to hear the words people are saying. Right? What, What do you do with that? People are saying, here's what you do with that. You call it what it is. It's rumor and it's gossip. People are saying it's rumor and it's gossip. Listen, when there's a rumor, when there's gossip, here's two things that are always true. Number one, when it's rumor and gossip, the source is not declared. And I'm not referring to current political events, okay? I'm just talking in general here. When it's rumor and gossip, the source is not declared. People are saying. They are saying. Who are they? Well, I I can't tell you right? The second thing about rumor or gossip is it's usually exaggerated and inaccurate. Rumor or gossip is never intended to help. It's always going to hurt. They, they weren't, these, these men weren't coming alongside Nehemiah. They, were, they weren't trying to help him. If you look back, it says that the letter was unsealed or the letter was open. If they were really trying to help Nehemiah and help him see this need, it wouldn't have been an unsealed letter. It was unsealed so that everyone could see it. So that the public could know what people were saying. And by the public knowing, they hoped to undermine Nehemiah's reputation and authority. Basically, the word was out on the street. You ever played the game gossip? Right? The word was on the street. Can you imagine how convoluted this accusation got as as it was spread? Look at Nehemiah's response. He wasn't going to waste time trying to defend baseless rumors. He simply said, you're making it up. You guys are crazy. You're just making this stuff up. And then he did what he always does. The only thing he can do, verse 9, he prayed, God, strengthen my hands. Well, this is a great opportunity to remind all of us to be careful about rumors and about gossip. 
I'm not saying this because there's anything currently going on, but we need to remember within the body of Christ, the greatest detriment to unity in the body is the tongue. We should ask a lot of questions before we even open our mouths. We should ask, is this necessary? Is it necessary for me to share this? Is it, is it confidential? Do I have the right to share this? And, and with whom? God hates the sowing of discord among the body. And anytime you have concerns, you, you, hear, you, you may hear something and be genuinely concerned that it might be true. What do you do? You go to the source, either the person you heard it from or the person about whom it was said, or if, if for some reason you can't do that, you go to leadership. You don't go to others who can't do anything more than you can but continue to spread the rumor. Maybe the most important question to ask when we hear information of what, what people are saying, maybe the most important question to ask is, is this true? If I don't know that it's true, I don't have any business repeating it. Someone has said, someone has defined gossip as news that you have to hurry up and tell someone else before you find out it isn't true. Right? Listen, I'm, I'm guilty. I've, I've repeated things and then found out they weren't true you know how hard it is to go back and figure out who you said that to and who they might have said that to and try to correct all that? Something you repeat and you hurry up and tell someone before you find out it isn't true. Well, the third tactic there in verses 10 through 13, they've tried to befriend Nehemiah. They've, they said, brother, we're trying to help you now in verses 10 through 13. Hey, we're trying to protect you. Shemaiah, referred to there in those verses, was a prophet, but he had sold out to the opposition. And so they're trying, he, Nehemiah goes to see him. Evidently there had been some level of trust there, but he tries to convince Nehemiah, hey, look, you need to take cover in the temple. Man, they're coming to kill you. Let's, let's me and you, let's go in the temple and hide out there so they can't get to you. Well, Nehemiah sees through that for a couple of reasons. Number one, Nehemiah could not legitimately uh, enter the temple where Shemaiah was able to be in that part of the temple because he would desecrate the temple and he'd be under God's judgment. He had no right to be in there. But secondly, Nehemiah knew God would not call him to run and hide. That would ruin his reputation. You think about it, in this entire, entire process of building the wall, all of the people had been in danger. So now Nehemiah is going to go and, and leave them in danger while he goes and hides in safety? That'd be like me saying to you, hey, I've got some inside information. Starting next week, our government is going to arrest Christians who gather in churches to worship. So here's what needs to happen. I'm going to flee the country, but you guys need to gather here and worship next week. What'd you think? Nehemiah couldn't go and, and hide. And, and, and I just want to say here, when we're talking about this prophet of God telling him what he needed to do, anytime someone tells you they have a word from God and it in any way violates or contradicts what God has already said, then you better be suspicious and you better be careful. If you can't check that word out that this person gives you from God and, and you can't find the truth of it in the word of God, you better run. Not into the temple, you just better run, okay? Now, look at verses 15 and 16. This is the most exciting two verses in the story. Think about all that they have been through. It seems like it seems like it's probably been a, a year when you consider all the hardship they've been through. But look what it says in verse 15. The wall was finished on the 25th day of the month, Elul. You see that next four words? In how many? 52 days. And when our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid. They felt greatly in their own esteem. They weren't as big as they thought they were. They perceived this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Listen, you, you may not think, and I guess some would say, well, <clears throat> this wasn't exactly a miracle. There wasn't a supernatural occurrence. It, it, it was men and women who built the wall, but clearly God's hand was on them. There's no question that God enabled this. 52 days. You ever seen pictures of the wall around Jerusalem? 
how high it is and how thick it is. It goes completely around the city. In 52 days, they came in where all this rubble was and cleared away what needed to be cleared away and rebuilt the wall. And the enemy nations looked and said, this could not have been done without the help of their God. You know what? That's that's the kind of church and the kind of ministry I want to be a part of. Where people who don't even know the Lord would say, look, I don't don't know or understand what's happening at that church, but clearly this God that they proclaim is doing something there. Well, in the balance of the chapter, you see that there is still an ongoing alliance to Tobiah. they are nobles within Judah, within the Jewish population there in Jerusalem, there are nobles that are listening to him, that are fooled by his lies. Why? Because they're not seeking the truth. Listen, there are people within churches today, within every church today, that aren't there to seek the truth. Solomon in the 28th chapter of Proverbs said, those who forsake the law praise the wicked. That's what was happening here at the end of chapter 6 as they would go to Nehemiah and talk about what a wonderful man Tobiah was and, and they would write letters back and forth and inform him of what was going on. There were some even within the assembly, if you will, that were not loyal. Well, in chapter 7, I'm going to be very brief on chapter 7. Basically, Nehemiah has to protect what's been accomplished. There is never a time to sit back and relax. Even when the task is is completed, the wall is rebuilt, he still has to work to protect. You see that he sets the doors and gates in place. He appoints uh, gatekeepers. He, uh, He appoints guards. We can't ever rest. You remember that Peter in 1 Peter 5, 8 said, Be alert. And of sober mind, your enemy of the devil prowls around, around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Even when the task is completed, they still have to be on guard. And then what you see in chapter 17, these long, or excuse me, chapter 7, these long list of people, the returns from the exile, Nehemiah is going to make sure the city is repopulated with God's people, with the Jews. And so they have these lists, and, and they had to prove their genealogy to get into the city. They had to prove that they were Jewish descendants in order to live in the city. And when I read that, I thought, you know, I wonder, I wonder how many of us can prove our spiritual genealogy to get in the city that God has prepared for those who belong to him. And then at the end of, of chapter 7, verses seven through 70 through 72, you see an offering is taken, uh, and that offering is taken for the temple. It's an act of worship. The people are so thankful for what God has done in in restoring them that it's a huge offering and act of worship uh, for God's temple. Well, what do we learn in Nehemiah 6? First of all, God enables us to overcome opposition in order to achieve his purposes. But the struggle for restoration is long. I guess you could say it's, it's, it's not eternal, but it stretches to eternity. God is going to enable us to overcome opposition. God is going to enable us to be a part of restoring people in our culture who need to know him. But it's going to be a struggle. There's going to be opposition, and that struggle is going to be long. It's going to be basically for our lifetime. And we also see from chapter 6 that just like Nehemiah, we live among people who are opposed to God. And because we live among them, there are going to be some relationships and some interdependencies with those people. We just have to be careful that we don't let those relationships cause us to compromise our loyalty to Christ. We, we can't isolate ourselves from the world so that we don't get tainted. We've, we've got to live among the world. We just need to be careful to make sure we never compromise our loyalty to Christ. Another thing we see in chapter 6 <clears throat> is the danger of rumors and gossip. I don't think I need to say more about that. But we need to think carefully about what we say, especially being careful to keep the unity of the body. And if we do have concern for someone, if we hear information about someone and we really are truly concerned, then let's handle it properly, not just spread the gossip to other people who all they can do is the same thing, just spread it further. And finally, we see <clears throat> here in Nehemiah, the people, <clears throat> the people who are going to get to live in Jerusalem were, were God's people. Listen, the people who are going to get to live in the new heaven and the new earth will be the people of God who've 
trusted Christ <clears throat> and received through faith the grace of God. If you want to be a part of God's family and live in the new heaven and new earth that's coming when this earth is destroyed, then you've got to know that you have relationship with Christ. These people had to know that they were part of the Jewish family. You've got to know that you're part of God's family.